Thank you so much for coming out this evening. It's a beautiful spring day out there, and I appreciate you coming inside to share this short hour together. Um, the book is launching today all over the country, um, to bookstores on Amazon.com and everything else. But really, I don't feel like it's my book, really. Um, over the past three years, so many people have helped with this. And in the acknowledgments, I thank them personally. But a few of those people are here. Um, Tanushri Isaacman, my assistant. Um, is she here? No, it's here. Uh, it's been great. Uh, Michelle Walker, Kate Maloff, Melissa Draper, others who have read drafts and helped out so much. And also the artist, um, Hannah Morris, who illustrated the cover and some of the images inside is also here today. Um, so I'd also, also like to thank C-SPAN, Book TV for being here, and um, for everyone else. So thank you so much to begin. Now, you'd probably be wondering, you know, why did I write a book about a 12 by 12 house? You know, <laughs> some people who have read some of my other books are here and they're, they were kind of wondering that. Um, I've written about international affairs. I've worked around the world on illegal logging issues, um, red, um, international developments. I've run big food pipelines into Africa. So why live in a 12 by 12 house? Well, I thought just to explain that, just to read two paragraphs from the preface um, to put into context and set the scene. At the beginning of 2007, I returned to America after a decade of aid and conservation work in Africa and Latin America. It was a rough homecoming. More than simple culture shock, I felt increasingly disillusioned. Though many of my projects abroad were successful, reducing poverty and protecting local rainforests, a destructive global system hammered away at the broader picture. For example, Nobel laureate scientists have predicted that global warming could cause half the planet's plant and animal species, species to become extinct in just a few decades. My creed, we can learn to live in harmony with each other in nature, was stressed to the breaking point. I landed in New York City and began asking myself a daunting question. How could humanity transition to a gentler, more responsible way of living? By replacing attachment to things with deeper relationships to people, nature, and self. Fortunately, I stumbled upon someone with some clues, Dr. Jackie Benton. The first time I met this slight 60-year-old physician, she was stroking a honeybee's wing in front of her 12 by 12 foot off the grid home on No Name Creek in North Carolina. She struck me as someone who had achieved self-mastery in these confusing times, but discovering how she'd done this would prove to be a riddle intricately connected to the house itself. So that's kind of how the journey began, and that was three years ago. Um, the book went through many forms, and it, it's a form of a memoir, um, 24 chapters, 12 by 12 in each part. And it weaves in certain bigger picture ideas about the global economy and sustainability into this sort of narrative, creative, nonfiction storytelling approach. So some of the ideas in the book that we'll talk about with David a little later, you know, the flat world versus the soft world, um, wild crafting, the leisure ethic, solitude, permaculture, the soft economy. These are some of the ideas that I learned with Jackie in the 12 by 12, and also through 10 years of working abroad from some of the indigenous cultures that I was in that are coming to the page in this book. So without further ado and without too much more time, I think I'd launch into reading a couple sections for you, uh, which I think is a good way to give a bit of the texture of the prose. So I'll start with the first chapter, which is called um, The Shape of the World. I know a doctor who makes $11,000 a year, my mother said. I looked up, suddenly curious. She's an acquaintance of mine, my mother continued, passing me a basket of bread. Lives an hour from here in a 12-foot by 12-foot house with no electricity. I noticed my father's empty seat next to her and felt my chest tighten. He was in the hospital. We still weren't sure if they'd been able to remove the entire tumor from his colon. I'd come down to North Carolina from New York City, where I'd recently settled after several years in Bolivia, so that I could be with him as he recovered. My mother went on. She's a tax resistor. As a senior physician, she could make $300,000, but she only accepts 11 so as to avoid war taxes. Do you know that 50 cents out of every dollar goes to the Pentagon? Hold on, so this doctor, Jackie Benton. Yeah, Jackie Benton, she lives in a 12 by 12 house? That's physically impossible. This bookcase is 12 by 12. She doesn't have any running water either. She harvests the rainwater from a roof. Haven't you heard of her? She's a bit of a local celeb. 
I stopped eating and looked out the window. The rust-colored sky above my parents' condo hovered exquisitely between orange and red. I could hear the hum of the refrigerator, the rush of cars going by. That distinctive sky momentarily brought me back to Lake Titicaca in Bolivia beneath a similar red-orange glow and the echo of a question a shaman asked me there, what is the shape of the world? Something moved inside me. I looked over at my mom and asked, do you have any way of contacting Dr. Benton? I have her mobile number, my mom said. She keeps it off, but does check messages every now and then. People are always trying to reach her, and that's made her even more reclusive. So that's how the whole thing kind of started. And then as I was waiting for her to call me back, she was just not calling me back down there. Um, a family friend in Chapel Hill invited me to do a local 5K race with him. You love the place where, he get, where we're going for this race, he told me. As we drove the SUV, he was in an SUV, through Chapel Hill onto the highway, he enthusiastically described the hills, forest, and lake of the race site. But I was baffled when we arrived at an industrial park. Sure, it was green, but the hills were landfills covered with sod, the lake artificial, the woods a monoculture. The place was spawned by AutoCAD, not Mother Nature. Like a bad toupee, it looked all the worse for trying to be something it wasn't. <laughs> I ran amid 200 others past the high-tech military suppliers between the human-made forests and lakes, and I realized that it wasn't just the aesthetics of the place that bothered me, but what it symbolized, the flat world. New York Times columnist Thomas Friedman presents the phenomenon in a positive light in his best-selling book, The World is Flat. Technologies like the internet, he observes, are breaking down hierarchies. Thanks to bandwidth, companies can easily outsource certain jobs to China, India, and elsewhere. Hence, people now compete on equal footing. It's not an argument to be taken lightly. Throughout the world, inequality is unfortunately on the rise, and the flat system has led to quick economic growth in certain countries like India and China. In our ever more inter interconnected worlds, environmental and human rights horrors can be more efficiently exposed. So why was I feeling the flat world blues? Friedman didn't invent the flat world, but rather his metaphor articulates a truth about the way we've come to imagine our 21st century. The metaphor carries a host of negative connotations. The world has hit a flat note. Industrial agriculture creates a flat taste. And multinational corporations flatten our uniqueness into homo economicus, serving a one-world uniplanet. A once natural atmosphere has been flattened by global warming. Every square foot of it now contains 390 parts per million of carbon dioxide. Though up to 200 years ago, it only contained 275 parts per million. Rainforests are flattened to make cattle pastures. A living ocean is depleted and flattened by overfishing. Vibrant cultures are steamrollered to the edge of extinction. Have the well-rounded objectives of America's founding fathers, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness been flattened to a single organizing principle, the unification of greed? When the 5K race was over, I left the awards ceremony and looked into the lifeless water of the lake beside Dow Chemical. Since returning to the United States, I felt something wasn't right with me. I'd been a squid out of ink. The joy squeezed right out of me. I closed my eyes and traveled back to Bolivia, to the banks of Lake Titicaca. I stood with a shaman as we admired the most extraordinary sky, a rusty orange and red blend, and the famous Andean Lake, which was the size of a small sea, its unseen far shores in Peru. We stood at 13,000 feet, and the light cast a gossamer shimmer over three distant islands, above them the jagged Andes. The shaman looked out over the landscape and asked me, what's the shape of the world? Farther up the lake, I saw the bride and groom, I was at a wedding, mingling with other Bolivian and American friends, all dressed in their finest. About half the Americans lived and worked in Bolivia, the other half were just there for the week. Honamti, the shaman, was dressed in an olive jacket and jeans and looked nearly iconic, his long hair tied back in a ponytail, an ambiguous expression in his dark eyes. The world, I finally said, it's round. How is it round? Hotamni asked. I showed him, putting my two fingers together in front of me and drawing a downward circle. That's how most people imagine it, he said, but we Aymaras disagree. He was silent for a long moment. Alpacas and sheep grazed in the distance, shepherded together by an Amaran woman in a colorful layer cake skirt. We say the earth is round, but in a different way, Honamti said. And he traced an upward circle 
the opposite of how I had drawn it, beginning at his belly and finishing at his heart. 